Good morning. Good morning. I just gonna have a couple of announcements real quick. Today we have Pastor Jeff Quick that is with us. So welcome him. My pastor is not here today. Uh, I want to announce that we have Trunk or Treat coming up for all the youth. And if you would love to help by donating candy or setting up a trunk, that would be so helpful for us. We're just gonna do it in our parking lot this year outside so the kids can dress up. It's gonna be on October 23rd from 6.30 to 8.30. So if you're interested in helping, just talk to me. I'll be here after church. And if you brought candy, there's donation bucket in the back. Do we have any other announcements? Okay, then we can go ahead with the prelude.
Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captain of sin and cannot bear us. We have sinned against you, O Lord, word of the King. I will have done that, and I will have done that. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As they call and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. Unless the Lord builds the house, in vain do the builders labor. Unless the Lord builds the house, in vain do the builders labor. Surely the Lord is in this place. This is the house of God. This is the end of heaven. Surely the Lord is in this place. This is the house of God. This is the name of heaven. Oh, come, let us worship. 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 We speak together. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty and ever-living God, increase in us your gift of faith, that forsaking what lies behind and reaching out to what lies ahead, we may follow the way of your commandments and receive the crown of everlasting joy for Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you please be seated. Let us pray. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from you. Bless Doug, who will read to us the scriptures. Make us hunger for the word of life, Jesus Christ our Lord.
As Jesus was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud, honor your father and your mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or mothers, or father, or children, or fields, for my sake, for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers, and sisters, mothers, and children, and fields, with persecutions, in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is truly a joy for Penny and I to be with you. Penny, hopefully you remember everybody. I'm dependent on you. So it's good to see you all. It's good to be with you. I know a lot of you. It's great to be back. And uh, when Pastor Mackey asked about pulpit supply, I said, gee, what's wrong with this picture? It's a win-win for us. We get to see kids, plus come back to this wonderful church and to be with you people. So it's a joy to be here. It's a joy to have Catherine play. I, I realize how much I miss that whenever I hear it, and it's great. And uh, I want to thank uh, and have Linda Schneider stand up, and I don't know if David Stewart is in here. The reason I have those two stand up, if you guys will stand up, I want you both recognized. I remember where I was three years ago, and I remember you two came to see me. And I treasure that, and I love you for it. But I got to tell you, and I want to make sure I, you take this to heart, whatever was said in ICU stays in the ICU. All right? I remember some of what I said, but I don't remember everything I said. I'm sure a lot of it was kind of weird. So thank you for being there. I just wanted to recognize you and tell you how much that meant to me. Uh, it meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to have your prayers for those times. Uh, I don't know how much you know about my story on that, but it truly is a testimony of what I would call the efficacy of prayer, uh, because my prognosis was a terrible one, one that you don't ever want to have. I had three choices. All three choices, the end result was fatality. So I took the one that was going to be maybe the best choice to be not so fatal. And uh, there's a whole lot of things that happened between that and what that means. And I did do things I never thought I'd ever do. But uh, I think the only reason I could say is God is with me. I'm here. I am a mortality case uh, in a medical journal somewhere. So, uh, uh, but I I'm, I'm guess I'm the living dead. I don't know. Maybe that TV shows are right. But it's a great to be with you and it's great to continue. So, what a blessing it is to be with you. This text from Mark's Gospel is an interesting one too. 
because I think we got here in the beginning of this text a very interesting character. I think it's somebody that you and I can feel really familiar with. But, you know, the truth of the matter is you and I hardly know this person. Because if you read what Mark actually says, right, automatically you're drawn into some errors and some assumptions. It does not say rich young ruler in the text as we popularly conceive this person. It doesn't appear in Mark at all. It doesn't even come from the Bible. St. Mark says nothing about him being young, and he says nothing about him being a ruler. One translation refers to him simply as a stranger. And so though familiar to us, that's what he is, a stranger. Many Christians have seen this person as a little bit different from themselves. And they've kind of stuck a black hat on him. You know why? Because you and I, of course, right? We follow the Lord Jesus. But we say about this one, here is somebody who tragically chose not to follow him. How blind can you and I be? Sometimes the text of scripture lets us know exactly how blind we can be and let us know how exactly out of touch with the Bible our own reality can be. Because the stranger that we read about, that Doug read about in Mark 10, is indeed a stranger to us because we don't see exactly, precisely, how thoroughly he actually is you and me. Now, here's an example of what I mean. A lot of Christians who give very little to God condemn this man for not giving at all, right? You hear that stewardship sermon coming? Huh? You thought you were safe from one of those today, didn't you? Because you had a guest pastor. Hey, it's too late for you to run it now because everybody's going to know why you left. <laughs> if you get up and leave, everybody's going to know. The fact is we shouldn't talk about stewardship and giving and all that only when we're involved in the annual campaign. To do so is putting the cart before the horse. And what does that mean? Well, most stewardship emphases, I think, in most churches have it all wrong. They got it backwards. They begin with some kind of need that's outside of the individual, right? You, you've seen it. You've seen it everywhere. You've seen it in congregations. You've seen it in organizations. You've seen it actually in synodical things. You see it all the time. It's talking about giving to this budget, giving to this fund, giving to these missions. And then moving on to responsibility for the individual human being. Well, maybe in our preoccupation with getting the bills paid, we're guilty of failing to see where between two of its most important concerns, the church has split and made an error. The church has gradually made more and more of a distinction between what I would call salvation and stewardship. And you've got these both emphases right here in this text. The distinction is difficult. In fact, I would say impossible to find in Holy Scripture. There we see salvation and stewardship inseparably related and connected. So the man in the story comes to Jesus with a question about salvation, right? We know that. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds with a stewardship answer. You lack one thing. Give up all you have, give to the poor, and come, follow me. Now, frankly, that doesn't fit what we will. It doesn't fit the system. We've not understood things that way. We've understood our salvation to be based solely on God's grace, right? Because we're Lutheran, and our faith responds to such grace is what it's all about. It's an exclusively spiritual business. It doesn't have anything to do with in any internal affairs. The soul, our relationship to God, is our business and our business alone. Anything external is what stewardship is. It's secondary. It involves our love for God and for the church. It concerns the practical business of supporting the work of the church. It's why we get on council and why we take votes and do those kind of things. And it's kind of arbitrary when it comes to working out our salvation. 
But that's not what the text says. That's not what scripture is about. In other words, it has had salvation as one concern in the church and stewardship in another. The Bible has not kept this separate, you see, and that's important for us to know if we're going to get at this text. Whatever we've done, it's enabled multitudes of us to be followers of Jesus without it costing us anything. And that, my friends, is what we often call cheap grace. Maybe we do get, in a essence, what we pay for. Maybe the conspicuous absence of abundant life among so many people who call themselves Christians is the simple result of people trying to live in a discipleship that really doesn't cost them much. But what he is saying, our Lord Jesus, in Mark 10 to this man is you must somehow get free from any kind of hold what you got has on you if you care to know the truth about eternal life. We're so vulnerable at that point, you know? One of my favorite Lutheran keepsakes is this. Cut a Lutheran in the side with a long, broad sword, he's gonna wipe off the blood and keep going. Stick a half pin in his wallet and he screams and falls over dead. <laughs> We gotta help our children, my friends in Christ, redefine what the good life is. We need to let people in on a little secret this morning. And that's what I think church is about, is let people in on secrets. It's the secret that the good life doesn't have anything at all to do in any way, shape, or form with any kind of materialism, with any kind of consumerism. The good life is the life one gives away. And we got a perfect example of it on the cross. So let's make it simple. This kind of stuff that we hold on to often destroys. When it isn't stopped, it kills everything. You can't love God and mammon. The experiment in our culture to see if we can sell Christianity by promising the blessings of mammon will fail. And we've heard this all the time in our world today. Christ did not come to make us prosperous. Christ did not come to make us successful. Christ did not come really to make us that happy. But you know, the more we talk about love, the more we realize we talk more about it than any previous generation. We love what we know, we know what we love. We rhapsodize about it with and whom we love. And, and, but it's kind of shallow. It's the I love you for what you do for me love. It's not serious love. It's not the deep stuff. That kind of love is willing to give whatever it has, all that it has, to its object. So what scripture talks about in this text is priorities. The text tells us we can't have the kind of prosperity we think we want. We can't have it as our first priority and find eternal life. And that's what I think Jesus is trying to get at here. The point is, whatever you are, whatever your status is, whatever your economic status, greed's got to go if you're going to find God. That's why a pop Christianity that's based on prosperity is inappropriate. And why when we hear it, we feel it that way. It essentially makes God the servant of our greed this, and defines the blessings of God in terms of that greed. Greed and serious love are at opposite ends of the pole. That great Methodist founder John Wesley's word to Christian believers still rings true and we can even gain something from it. He says, gain all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Give it all. We want, money never stays with me. It would burn me if I did it. Throw it out of my hands as soon as possible, Wesley says, lest it find its way into my heart. And that's the danger, you see. It's not that it's evil. It's that it has an insidious way of finding its way to our hearts. The pandemic, I think, has so dramatically proven this simple, basic truth over and over again. I can't tell you how often when I look at Facebook and I see churches struggling 
to meet their budgets and the gifts they're giving is showing the exact truth of this text. It's based on a whole false dichotomy. For those of us then who are susceptible to this power that things have, giving our money away becomes an expression of quite serious love, doesn't it? It's the kind of love that involves more than feelings. It's the kind of love that transcends blessings and expresses itself in very disciplined and rational ways in many cases. That's the only way to get beyond love that is merely an expression of self-involvement. Was it Eric Fromm in The Art of Loving? I think he contended that human loving is an art to be learned, and I think that's a good way to write about love. He writes of a certain general requirements that it takes to master any kind of art. Musicians know about this. Foremost among these is discipline. I'll never be good at anything if I do not do it in a disciplined way. Anything if I, I do only if I am in the mood may be nice. It might be amusing, but I'll never become a master. That isn't how most people think about love today, is it? I saw all the people getting pictures of the homecoming dance. It make me thought and reflect on this real, real truth. Discipline, discipleship, wow, comes from the same root. The cross is where all of that stuff, all of those self-serving ideals about love come under the ultimate judgment of the gospel. That man in Mark, he might have been rich, he might have been young, he might have even been a ruler. He might have been all three of those. But what he forfeited is the life that he sought. And so might we. Forget the needs of the world for a minute. Forget the needs of this congregation for a minute. Forget the needs of the Lutheran Church for a minute. And work out your own salvation instead with some kind of fear and trembling. Are we in the process of forfeiting our lives by trying to keep them? What have we done with all those plain words that Jesus uses about losing our life by saving it and finding our life by losing it for the sake of the gospel? Who is it that comes running up to Jesus today and says, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Who is it? I know who it is. It's me. It's no stranger at all. It's somebody really familiar to us. The stranger is the one who answers, rather, turn loose of everything you have, and then come and follow me. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of Christ Jesus our Lord.
invite you to join with me in confessing the faith of the church and the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was dead. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated by the hand of God. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. day 
send us the power of your Holy Spirit. Revive us with the body and blood of our risen Savior. Illumine our lives with your presence and shine your morning star over the whole human race. For that light is Christ. Thanks be to God. By the grace of God, we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. My friends of Jesus, table is set for you in this place. Partake of the nourishment for your journey. Let you be seated.
Grable, please rise. We say together in the post communion capital. Now, now Lord, Lord, we are your servant, go in peace. Your word is faithful, fails. My own now eyes have seen the salvation of the nation. Did you prepare the insight of every nation? The light to reveal you to the nations, and the glory of your people in Israel. Now, Lord, we let your servant go in peace. Let us pray. God of the welcome table, in this meal we feast on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth sustained by these gifts so we may share your neighborly love with all through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. Neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God, the Creator of Jesus the Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Amen. 